Chapter Seventeen of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Seventeen, Insured. Pasco Pepperell had taken the schoolmaster with him through the marketplace. He was greeted on all sides by acquaintances and would-be dealers. Pasco's strut became more consequential as he returned the salutations, and as he looked out of the corners of his eyes at his companion to see what impression was made on him by the deference with which he was received. "'I bought wool, two hundred pounds worth, of that man. Coker is his name,' said Pasco, indicating a moor farmer jogging in on his cob. "'I bought last Friday. Do you see Ezra Bornigan? There, sneaking behind his missus. He's had coals of me all the winter, on tick. Hasn't paid a penny, and I'm in doubts whether I shall see the color of my money. But I'm not the one to be crushed by a few bad debts. Presently. There's the landlady of the Crown at Newton. She knows where to get good spirits at a moderate figure, that hasn't paid duty. Tobacco also. Coombe Cellars is a fine place for a trade in such goods. How do you do, Pepperell? said a bluff farmer, coming up and extending an immense red hand. Come here to buy, or to sell to-day? Both, answered Pasco. It doesn't do to let money lie idle. Ah, if a chap has got money, but when he hasn't, that's another matter. I want to sell. What? Hides. Will you buy? Had bad luck with my beasts. Don't know. I'll see. It's terrible bad times, said the big man. I suppose it is, for some folks, answered Pepperell. I say, I hear you've got the swing on down again your way. Not quite that, I hope. There's been an incendiary fire, but it was the work of one man, not of a gang. I reckon the swing conspiracy was done with in thirty. Don't be too sure. One fire has a fatal knack of kindling others, especially if the fellow gets off who did the job. He has escaped, said Pasco but we know pretty well who did the mischief. It was one Roger Redmore. He'd been turned off for impertinence to his master, and drink, and that's how he revenged himself. I wish he'd been caught. A fellow who sets fire a purpose to rick or barn or house, if I had my way, would be hung without mercy. No transportation. That's too mild. Swing, I say, at a rope's end, and so put an end to all incendiarism. I reckon you're about right, said the farmer. If there comes another fire, I shall get insured. The fellow is at large. Aye, but he won't do any further mischief of this sort. It was a bit of personal revenge, nothing more. Not like them old combinations. Well, but who is safe? If I say a word to one of my men that he doesn't like, he may serve me as Redmore has served Pook. That's true, said Pepperell. More's the reason that Roger should have been made an example of. If I seed him, I'd shoot him down as I would a wild beast, or hang him as I might a lamb-worrying dog, with my own hands, that I would. I know, of those rascals who were sentenced to be hung in thirty, more than half got off with transportation, and of them as was transported, most got let off with six or seven years. More's the pity. We're too merciful, that's our fault, said Pasco. Show no pity to the offender, chief of all to the incendiary, and such crimes will soon be put a stop to. We encourage criminals by our over gentleness. Well, I hope this firing of stacks won't spread, but it's like scarlet fever. What business are you on today? I've bought the oaks at Brimps, said Pepperell. So I've heard, and I've a mind to dispose of the bark. Then here's your man, Hamley the tanner. The man alluded to came up, a tall, handsome fellow with a cheery face. "'Mr. Hamley,' said Pasco, "'you're the chap I want. I shall have tons of bark to sell shortly.' "'Well, Mr. Pepperell, I'm always ready for bark, if the figure suits. Tan is my trade, you know. I shall have stuff the like of which you have not had a chance of buying, I'll be bound. I've bought the oaks of Brimps.' "'What, at Dartmeat?' Yes, bought the lot. The timber is three hundred years old, hard as iron, and can see what the bark must be when the timber is so good. I doubt if we shall come to terms over that. 
Why not? You won't have another chance. What will you give me a ton? Is the bark running now? It's full early. The sap don't begin to rise so soon as this, leastways not in timber trees, and the moor is always three weeks or a month behind the hams. The bark will be all right, if you will buy. What is the market price? Best bark has been up to seven guineas, but it's not that now. Five guineas is an outside price for thirty-year-old coppice. But Brimps is not coppice, far from it. I know, and the value will be according. Sapling, of some forty years, comes second at four guineas. The last quality is timber bark, if not too old, say three pound ten. Three pound ten, echoed Pepperell. A pretty price indeed. You do not understand. Brimps oaks must be three hundred years old, and so worth seven guineas a ton. I won't give three guineas for this bark. Take off a pound for every hundred years. If I take it, I don't mind two guineas. Two guineas? That's not worth having. The bark is first rate. Must be. It's tremendous old. That is just what spoils it. We get the tan juice from the under rind. We don't want the crust or outer bark. That is so much waste. Young coppice is the best for our purpose, and worth much more for tanning than thrice the value of your old timber. I'll give you two guineas, not a penny more. And let me tell you, you'll have some difficulty in barking the old trees. The sap is a wonderful ticklish thing to run in them. It's like the circulating of blood in old men. Two guineas! I won't look at em, said Pepperell, and passed on. He was angry and disappointed. He had reckoned on making a good price out of the bark. This meeting with Mr. Hamley would have had a bad effect on the schoolmaster. Pepperell turned to him and said, He's a cunning file. He knows the brimp's bark is worth seven guineas at least, but he's trying to drive a bargain. He'll come round in time and be glad to buy at my price. Hallo! Pepperell was clapped on the back and turning saw his brother in law. Pasco, old boy, said Jason. Is it true you bought his two years' stock of fleeces off Coker? Yes, I did. More fool you. What did you pay? A thirteen pence. Done you are. Have you not heard that wool has dropped to ten pence? Jason, it is not true? It is. There have come in several cargoes of Australian wool, finer than ours, and behind, they say, is simply any amount, mountains of wool. This comes of your not reading the papers. Coker knew it, and that made him so eager to sell. I hear we shall have a further drop. You are done, old boy, in the speculation. Why did you not consult me? Have you paid Coker? I gave him fifty pounds, at a bill at two months. Try what you can do with the sloggets. They may want to buy, but don't reckon on making more than tenpence. Lucky if you get that. I dare swear they will offer no more than ninepence. Pepperell's face became white. But he quickly rallied, and said to Bramber, "'That is Quorm all over. He loves a joke, and he thought to frighten me. I'll go at once to Sloggett. I know where to find him. He has a mill at Buckfestley.' He caught the schoolmaster's arm, and drew him along with him. He had not gone many steps before a stranger addressed him. "'Mr. Pepperell, I believe?' "'Certainly. You were pointed out to me. You have done some business with us, the wood at Brimps.' I am the agent of the bank. I think we oughtn't to have come to so hasty a conclusion. The fact is, we hadn't any idea there was so much forest timber there, but as it is, of course, it can't be helped. Only bank rules, you understand, must be observed. And what are they? Well, it is all the same whether we are dealing with the Duke of Bedford or with you. Rules are rules, you know. Of course rules are rules, but what are your rules? I'm only an underling. I don't make rules. It is my duty to see that they are carried out. You comprehend? To be sure. And what are those rules? Well, you are aware in the bank we always expect payment before delivery. There is the agreement. Mr. Quorm saw our head clerk, and it is all settled. I just came along over the moor to Ashburton Fair, and had a look at Brimps on my way. They sent me, you know, to see that all is square, and all that sort of thing. I have nothing more to do than to just see that you comprehend the rules. What am I to do? answered Pepperell sharply. Well, well, it is just this. We don't allow any timber, nothing, to be removed till full payment has been made. 
and I see you have already begun felling. Yes, I suppose my brother-in-law has begun to cut. You know, that's all right and proper, but rules are rules, and I'm not my own master. I don't make regulations, and am held to seeing them carried out. There's a matter of a couple hundred pounds you'll have to pay to the bank before a stick is disposed of, or a ton of bark removed. And when do you demand the money? Will not a bill do? Rules, you see, are rules. They ain't India rubber that you can pull about to accommodate as is desired. I dare say you want to get the timber removed as quickly as you can, but, hang it, rules are rules, and you can't till the money is paid in cash. Personally, I love bills, but the bank don't. That's a fact. I suppose you, or Mr. Quorum, will be over next week at the bank and pay up. Then we've nothing to say but clear away the timber and the bark as you can. When Pepperell had shaken off the agent of the bank, he turned to Bramber and said, Did you catch his admission? He said that the bank had made a mistake in letting us have Brimp's wood so cheap. Actually, it sold without ever having seen. Of course I shall pay up. And if I don't pocket a thousand pounds out of the transaction, call me a fool. A moment later, he was touched on the arm and saw the landlady of the crown, Mrs. Fry. She made him a sign and whispered, Take care. The revenue officers have smelt something. Have you a stock by you? Pepperell nodded. That's bad. Get rid of it as quick as you can, lest they pay you a visit. I've had a hint. Thanks, said Pasco, looking uncomfortable. His visit to Messrs. Sloggett was more discouraging than he had been led to expect. Mr. James Sloggett, who was in Ashburton, told him bluntly that the firm was indisposed to buy wool at any price. The importations from Australia had disturbed the market, and there was no knowing to what extent wool might fall. They would buy nothing till they had received advice as to how much more foreign wool was coming in. "'That won't touch me,' said Pasco. "'Down it goes in a panic, and up it will swing in a month or two, and then I shall sell. Come with me to the Red Lion, and have a glass of ale.' "'Thank you,' said Bramber. "'If you will excuse me, I should wish to go into the fair.' "'There is time enough,' answered Pepperell. "'I shall not let you go yet. "'What? "'Jason, here again?' Quorum limped up and planted himself in front of him. "'I've hardly had a word with you yet, Pasco. "'How is my sister? "'And how is Kitty?' "'Both pretty middling. "'Kitty is here, in the fair. "'I left her with Jan Pook and his party. "'Something may come of this, Zira thinks. "'Jan has been mighty attentive since they were together in that boat.' Pasco, said Jason, that fellow, Roger Redmore, is abroad still. Yes, he has not been caught. If I was you, I would ensure. Shoo, I'm not afraid of fire. There's no telling. You keep such a stock of all kinds of goods in your place, coals, spirits, wool, hides, and now you are likely to have bark in. Take my advice and ensure, in case of accident. It is throwing good money away. Not a bit. If Pook had insured, he would not now be the loser to the tune of fifty pounds. Well, I don't mind. But if I insure, it shall be for a round sum. Two or three hundred? Bah! A thousand! A thousand? Why not? My stores are worth it. Are they? Stores? And house as well? No, stores alone. I'll consider about the house. A thousand pounds? You mean it, Pasco? Aye. I'll insure for one thousand two hundred. I shall have all Coker's wool in, and the Bimp's tan which Hamley won't buy, and I shall be having coals in during summer when price is down, to sell in winter when prices are up. Twelve hundred, Jason, not a penny under. Come on, then, to the office, and have your policy drawn. We do business in a large way, said Pepperell, turning to Bramber. Twelve hundred would not cover my loss were that scoundrel Redmore to set fire to my stores. Now I will let you go. May you enjoy yourself. Come, Jason, twelve hundred. End of chapter 17